The title of this evening's reflection is The Healing Power of Confession. Please stand for the gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have ne never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when... But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we, have to, we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a woman who was known for her great virtue and her charitable giving. She gave to the church. She looked after her neighbor. She tended to the poor. And she did everything that she could to live a good Christian life. Except this woman had a secret. She had a secret sin that she was horribly embarrassed and afraid to talk about, afraid to confess. She would spend many long hours before this icon, this image of the Blessed Mother, and she would weep tears of sorrow before this image, asking and begging Mary to help her and to guide her to her son. But every time she would approach her confessor, she, every time she would approach her spiritual father, she would confess everything else, and then when it came to this one secret sin, she couldn't move herself to do it, and she would hold back. Until finally, after her long life, she died. And when she died, they started gathering together her family to hold her funeral. One of her daughters was very far off, and so they had to send for her, and it took her three days to get to her mother for the funeral. And so on the third day, when her daughter arrived, they began the funeral procession and the chants and the songs 
and the lamentations for this woman. And they, they had pulled the casket up to the front of the church, and while they were singing and praying for her, and many of them weeping, the woman sat up in her coffin, alive once more, and said, call for the priest, my spiritual father. And the, the people, quite astonished at what had just happened, called for the priest, and while they were getting the priest, she said, let me tell you what has happened to me in these last three days. She said that when she had died and she, her soul had left her body, the demons had come and they had started to drag her down into hell because they rejoiced over the fact that she had an unconfessed sin. They rejoiced in the fact that they thought they had won. And while they were taunting her and tormenting her, this bright light of the Holy Virgin Mother of God began to come forward. And Mary, standing over her soul, rebuked the demons and said that they had no right to take her soul before she had been judged by her son. So the Blessed Mother took her soul and brought it up to the judgment seat of Almighty God. And she approached the great throne of our Lord Jesus. And she said that when she saw the Lord sitting at his throne, he looked very displeased and very upset. And the Blessed Mother pleaded, pleaded with her son. She came forward and said, My son, this poor woman, she has cried many tears before me and has asked that you have mercy on her. And the Lord Jesus said, Oh, Mother, but you must understand that without the great mystery of confession that this woman cannot be saved, her soul cannot be redeemed because she has not gone to confession. And she says, Mother, the Mother Mary responds, Yes, but, oh, my son, you who are mercy itself, could you not look with compassion on her because your mercy is greater then all sin. And the Lord said, Mother, that you may not be distressed over this, I will send this woman back into her body and give her one final opportunity to confess. And if she confesses, her soul will be saved. And so this woman's guardian angel takes her soul and carries it back to her body and she is raised from the dead at that moment, and she calls her confessor, and she confesses her sin. And before she goes to sleep in the Lord again, she warns and cautions her family. She says, confess your sins and pray for my soul. Your tears are not as beneficial to me as your prayers. And she exhorted them all to live good Christian lives. And then she fell back asleep into the Lord. Now, we hear a story like that and we, I, we can just marvel at the incredible mercy and the incredible love of not only our Lord Jesus, but also the Blessed Mother and how they are constantly working to intercede for us, to provide for us that peace, that sense of stability that they want to give us through the practice and exercise of our faith. But confession, I think, for many Catholics is kind of a mixed up matter. It's kind of something that is very difficult, and we all know why, right? Because the more we need it, the less we want it. But that's only because oftentimes we don't understand the great mercy of God. We don't always appreciate just how much God loves us. And this is true all the way back to the beginning of creation. We can look at the very beginning of humanity with Adam and Eve. If we were to go to Genesis chapter 3, that famous account of the fall of man. You know, we all know the story, right? The Lord tells Adam and Eve, he says, that they can eat of any of the trees in the Garden of Eden, except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the Lord gives a very specific command whenever he tells them not to eat of the tree. He very specifically says, 
if you eat of it, you will surely die. You know, he was very specific. He didn't have to be that specific. He said, if you eat of it, you will surely die. So then the serpent comes and says, no, if you eat of this, you won't die. You'll gain knowledge. You'll gain understanding. You'll gain clarity. And so Adam and Eve, they ate of the tree, they ate of the fruit, and they didn't die. So one author asked, did the serpent get it right? They ate, and God said that they would die, and they didn't. So what happened? Did they die? The Lord was not specific in his command. He could have said, on the day you eat of it, you will be sentenced to death, or you will begin to die, or I will have the right to kill you. But that's not what he said. The Lord said, on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what did our Lord mean? We know that the serpent is the liar. So when we see how the Lord created the animals in the six days leading up to the creation of man, he breathed into them, to the, into them the breath of life. But it wasn't the same as the type of life breath that he breathed into man's nostrils. Man received the living nephesh in Hebrew, right? The, the life, the divine life of God. God breathes into him his own spirit, his own divine spirit, which means that now man has two ways in which he lives. A divine way, the way of grace in his soul, and his physical way, his mortal way, the way of his body. So what poison does to our body, what a bullet would do to our brain, mortal sin does to our soul. So when the Lord cautioned Adam and Eve against eating of the fruit and telling them that they would surely die, he was calling them to, to understand that it was his life within them that was going to die. Now we have to understand that there are different types of sin. There is, of course, mortal sin, the sin of when we break God's command and we lose the life of grace within us. We know that there has to be three conditions for that to be fulfilled, right? And the first one, it has to be serious. It has to be serious matter. It can't be a small thing. Mortal sin has to be something that is a grave issue, a grave matter, a grave act. But we also have to know that. We have to have full knowledge of that fact. And then thirdly, we have to want to do it. So if we didn't know that, or if we didn't want to do it and we were forced to do it, then we would not have committed a mortal sin. See, now, but when Adam sinned, he committed the worst of sins because he committed a sin of malice. Adam knew what he was doing. He had a heightened understanding, a metaphysical sense of the difference between right and wrong. And yet he chose to disobey the command of God. This isn't less of a death whenever we sin and lose the grace of God in our soul. This is infinitely more of a death. We have two ways of living. And because the divine life is more valuable than human life. But the two are closely connected. When we deliberately commit mortal sin, the one is snuffed out even if our bodies remain unharmed. So there's a mystery here that Adam didn't grasp, that he didn't understand. And when God showed up, Adam went and hid. He tried to cover his nakedness. He tried to hide from God. Now, it can be a, a, a tendency to see what happens next is, is God kind of interrogating Adam like it's some kind of police interrogation or something like that. But that's not what's going on at all. As a matter of fact, the Lord is trying to get Adam to admit his fault. He's trying to get Adam to an act of contrition, right? So he starts with four questions. First thing he says to him is, where are you? Now, God wasn't asking Adam, where is your location on a map, right? Where's your geographical location? God knows where we are better than we do. He was asking him, where are you in relation to me? Something has changed now. Something is different. 
Now, Adam here, he says four things in response to this one question, and none of them actually answers the question. You know, if Adam had just come out of the, out of the bush at that moment and said, Lord, I'm right here, you found me, I did it, I blew it, could you possibly have mercy on me? Could you possibly forgive me for my foolishness? How different would the course of humanity have been if Adam had merely sought forgiveness? But that's not what he does. He says, I heard you coming. And he's like, sort of like, you know, what, you just barge in, you don't knock, right? You know, I, I had to get dressed, you know, this type of thing. You know, Adam was immediately defensive, not understanding what God was doing. Now, at this point, God could have said, you know what, we've had enough of this, and he could have just zapped Adam right there and started with a sequel, right? Adam 2 and, and started over. But he didn't do that. He asks him a second question. He says, who told you that you were naked? And before Adam even had a chance to answer that question, he says, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? You know, as, as though God needed anyone to tell him what Adam had did, he was not trying to coerce this confession out of Adam. He was trying to get him to make an act of contrition. He was trying to move him to a sense of sorrow for what he had done. But how does Adam respond to this? He says... The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and so I ate. And so what is he doing here? Now he's blaming someone else. He's blaming the woman that God placed with him, but he's not just blaming the woman, he's saying to God himself, this helper that you gave me, some help she turned out to be, and he's blaming his creator for the sin that he had committed. Now, at this point, you could really see where God would have had enough and just started over, but he didn't. Now God turns to the woman and says, why did you do this? And she says, the woman gives the, straight, the simplest and most straightforward answers. She says, the serpent beguiled me and I ate it. And this proved to be just enough for God to work with. Someone had finally given him a straight answer, a sense of an understanding of what had happened. And then the next words out of God's mouth was, was the promise of a redeemer, the promise of one who was going to come and to restore what had been lost. We oftentimes don't understand the ways of God. We don't understand what he's trying to do. We get defensive and we try to excuse ourselves and we resent instead of repenting. There's the story of a, uh, a monk who was uh, living in his monastery and he was very much struggling with his vocation, and so he eventually goes to his abbot and says that, you know what, I've, uh, I think it's time for me to leave. I don't think I'm going to, um, I really can't do this. I'm not getting anything out of prayer, and uh, every time I pray, I feel dry. I feel completely abandoned by God, and uh, I think it's just best if I leave. And his abbot says to him, he says, okay, all right. Well, before you go, I want you to do one thing for me. So he hands him this basket, and uh, he, he pulls it out of this, this cupboard and he says, I want you to go and get some water out of the river for me with this basket. And he says, okay, whatever. So he takes the basket and he starts walking down to the river. And as he's walking down, he looks down and he notices that his basket is a wicker basket. And he thinks to himself, well, this isn't going to hold much water, but whatever. So he goes and he fills up his basket with water. And sure enough, by the time he makes it back up at the hill, all the water is drained out of the basket. So he gets to his abbot and he says, do you have anything else for me to, to carry the water with or something? He says, no, just go try it again. So he says, okay. So he goes down and he tries it again. And of course, same thing, all the water drains out of the basket. So third time he comes to him and says, look, I don't know what you're trying to get me to do here, but it's obviously not working. He said, look, just go try it one more time and then come see me. So frustrated, the, uh, the monk agrees one more time knowing what's going to happen. He fills his water, the water up in the basket. He gets back up the hill, and he says, look, it's all gone. I don't know what's going, what you're trying to accomplish with all this, but I think I'm done. It's just like my prayer life. It, it, it doesn't seem to be anything coming from it. And the abbot tells the, the monk, he says, my son, look into the basket. And the, the monk, he, he holds the basket up, and he looks into it, and he that he looks at it, he realizes that that basket that was old and dirty and dusty and had been up in that cupboard for who knows how long was now washed clean 
and pristine and ready for use, ready to, to hold whatever it was that they needed. And the abbot said, this is what prayer does to the soul. This is what happens when we trust God, that we may not always feel it working, we may not always feel it operating within our soul, it may not be something that we are even able to acknowledge, we might feel like God is far from us when we pray. But in that effort of putting ourselves in God's presence and asking for that grace, our soul is being purified. Our soul is being made ready. It's being strengthened for the journey ahead. It's being uh, purified continually by God's grace, making us worthy vessels to carry his word, if only we persevere. The Lord is constantly calling us. He's constantly asking us to come to him, not because it's going to do anything for him. You know, have we ever thought about that? Why does God ask us to pray? God doesn't ask us to pray because we add something to God, that we make him more glorious, that we make him, we, we make him more in some way, right? No, God asks us to pray because it's for us, because it's something that we need, that it perfects our souls and that it draws us closer to our end, which is union with God. It's the perfection of our nature that makes us happy. I remember whenever I was um, in about the fifth grade or so, um, for those of you who have read my, my bio on the website, uh, I was homeschooled um, all through uh, my, my schooling, all through high school. And uh, when I was about in fifth grade or so, um, my, I, w I remember distinctly doing some, some math homework for my mom, and there was this, like, this math quiz or whatever, something I had to take. And my mom had, uh, for whatever reason, I, I don't know, but she had left the, the answer key to the, to the math problems right next to all of my other books. And I was really struggling with uh, this particular math lesson, and I was like, you know what, maybe I should just check the answer key, just to make sure I'm on the right track, right, you know. So I pull it off the shelf, and I start looking through it, and I start looking, and sure enough, would you know it, by the end of it, all the answers were filled out, right? So I, I just filled out everything from the answer key. And so, you know, a couple of days go by after that, and I remember feeling really guilty about that, really, really guilty about that, but I didn't want to tell mom and dad that I had basically cheated on that uh, math quiz, right? So I, I, but I did want to go to confession. So... I went over to mom and dad, but I was really nervous. I was really afraid to ask him that question because I was like, well, if I ask mom and dad if they can take me to confession, the first thing they're going to say is why, right? What, why do you, you want to go? Um, but finally, uh, because it was bothering me, I worked up the courage to ask them if they would take me to confession. And not only did they not ask me why, they were very, very happy that I had asked, and they, they took me immediately. They, they, and they even told me later, they said that, you know, anytime you want to go, all you have to do is ask. No questions asked, we'll take you to confession. And later, I was reflecting on that. I was realizing, well, if that's how my parents would, res would respond to me wanting to go to confession, how much more so would God, whenever I turn to him, provide for me everything that I need and give me everything that I need to return back into his good graces, to be refreshed and put back into the divine life of God's grace. Our Lord is constantly making that call. He's constantly asking us, begging us, pleading with us to come and to accept the mercy of that he wants to give. This mentality that we seem to have developed in our culture, uh, a, a mentality of losing any sense of guilt, any sense of sin itself, We've, we, we continually seem to have this idea that if I don't address the issue that I'm dealing with, whatever it is, that uh, it, you know, it's, it's going to go away. I don't have to deal with it, which, of course, is uh, leading to further and further um, 
bringing ourselves farther and farther from God and from that sense of peace that the Lord is trying to give to us, and it's making it harder and harder for us to distinguish right from wrong. There was a, an article I was reading a couple of years ago about this Christian, I, she might have been Catholic, I'm not sure, she was a reporter that was uh, reporting on a lot of media that you were seeing in, um, in the culture today, and one of the things she kept hearing about was, I'm sure you've heard of it, the, the TV show Game of, Thro uh, Game of Thrones, right? So she says, everybody's saying you gotta go watch this show on HBO. And so she decided she was gonna, gonna try it out. And so she, she, she watches it, and of course, you know, there's, there's all of this uh, immorality and um, nudity and, 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 and violence and all this other stuff in the, in the show. And she goes to one of her friends who had recommended this to her, and, and they, she said, uh, you know, you know, what's the big deal, right? You, you, you didn't warn me about any of this or anything, you know, why didn't you tell me about this? And, and how could you recommend a show like this? And she said, oh yeah, you know, I guess, I guess that, that is, you know, in there. But that's only really the first season, you know, when you get to the, the later seasons, that's not really that bad. And so she said, okay, well, I'll skip ahead to some of the later seasons to see uh, how it is. And she did so, and she said it was worse. She said that it, it, it slowly and progressively got worse. And this is what sin does to our soul, right? It desensitizes us to the effect that sin has on our soul, such that we, don't, we begin to no longer realize its seriousness. And again, we become resentful instead of repentful. We can look back into Mark chapter 2, whenever the uh, the paralytic man is brought up to the roof tiles um, uh, when our Lord has the great crowd around him and they lower the man out down from the roof into the Lord's myth, midst. And what does the Lord say to him at that moment? Right? Something that none of them really understood why the Lord would say this. He said, your sins are forgiven. Now, the men up on the roof are up there thinking, well, that's not what he needs, right? We, we lowered him down here in front of you so you could heal his body. And the people around them are saying, well, you don't have the power to do that anyway. Only God has the power to forgive sins. But the Lord's point here was that what is far more powerful, far more important than any physical healing that could take place would be the spiritual healing of the soul. And he was trying to raise up their understanding of that fact and of that concept, that the spiritual blessedness that the Lord comes to bring to us in our faith and particularly in our sacraments, that is far more beneficial to us than anything that the Lord could do for our body, which is passing and transitory. You know, I serve at the, as rector at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help, and uh, you know, there are several miracles that have taken place at the shrine. You know, we have, if you walk down downstairs into our little crypt area, there's a wall uh, on the back, uh, the back wall, there's uh, all of these crutches and canes and things that people have left behind over the years uh, from the spiritual favors and healings that they've received from our Blessed Mother, particularly the, the intercession of our Blessed Mother uh, through their prayers and the healing of Almighty God. But that is nothing in comparison to the spiritual healing that people get when they come to the shrine and they give, them, give themselves over to our Lord when they're there. The, the, the one comment that people always make is the incredible sense of peace when they go there. The, the incredible sense of feeling the presence of the Blessed Mother and of our Lord Jesus when they enter into that place. And that peace and that desire to know God, the desire to grow closer to God, is far more meaningful, far more powerful for them than any physical healing that they could have experienced. Now, but the devil, the devil doesn't want any of this, obviously. The devil wants to try to, he wants to try to hold us back. He wants to try to keep us on this path of keeping our sins secret, right? Because if, if our sins are secret, if they're hidden away, if there's something that is never spoken of, then that's when they have the real power over us. Scott Hahn, whenever he was talking about his own 
conversion experience, his own conversion story. He had already converted to uh, Catholicism, and he was uh, trying to get to confession every week, um, trying to be very faithful to that practice of weekly confession. And he said that you know there was he was a professor, and there was one week where he the exams were due, and he was grading all these papers and taking care of all of these responsibilities. And uh, he said that it had been like three or four weeks since he had been to confession. And he remembers sitting down at the dinner table and his wife, who was not Catholic yet at the time, uh, asked him, how long has it been since you've been to confession? And his response was, well, what's it to you? You don't even believe it's a sacrament anyway. And she says, I don't know. It says, whenever you go, you're so much nicer and kinder and gentler with us and the kids than when you don't. We can always tell the difference. And so he said, he said, all right, all right, fine. So he, he picks himself back up, and he, he goes to confession. And he says, you know, when, I, when he was coming back, he was thinking to himself, you know, what if I had gone three or four weeks without a shower, right? What if I had gone three or four weeks without brushing my teeth, you know? Do you think that my family would have noticed? And, you know, of course, right? You know, it's the same with our soul. If we, if we wait too long, if we allow those things inside to fester, if we allow those, 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 this, those hidden sins, those things the devil wants to keep uh, hidden and secret, because that's what gives him power over us, then it absolutely affects our peace. It, it affects our ability to find happiness, especially happiness with God. I'd like to close with a story, a a pretty famous story of this priest from the Archdiocese of New York who had studied in Rome in his seminary years, and he was, several years after he had been ordained a priest, he was sent back to Rome on this month-long conference. And so he was going back and forth from St. Peter's uh, to his hotel and some of the other churches around the area where he was visiting. And one day, in between one of the conferences, he was, he was stopping by a church, and he noticed some, some beggars that were lined up along the church steps, which is very common in Rome. And he, he goes through, and he, he goes into the church, and when he gets into the church, there's just something that really bothers him. Like, you know, he really felt like he recognized one of the, one of the homeless uh, that were out there on the steps. And so he couldn't get it out of his mind, and so he goes back outside, and he finds this beggar, and he says, do I know you? And uh, the beggar responds, oh, yes, you know me. And he says, well, who are you? He says, well, we went to seminary together, you know, and I got ordained a priest, but, you know, then it all fell apart, and, you know, I basically ruined my life. And he said, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry, I'll pray for you. I have, to, I have to go to this conference now, but um, please, you know, please know that I'll be praying for you. Um, and so he leaves, and, and he goes to the conference, and he's very disturbed by this. A few days later, uh, this priest from New York is, is going to meet the Holy Father. You know, they, they, they were given sort of a special audience with the Holy Father where everybody's supposed to you kind of line up, and you come up, and you, you, you get like a rosary or something from the Pope, and you know, say thank you, Holy Father, or I love you, Holy Father, or whatever, and then you kiss his hand, and then you leave, right? Well, when he, um, when this priest from New York came up, he was still thinking about his, uh, his friend, and he kind of just blurts out right there, you know, Holy Father, could you pray for, you know, this priest? Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Swiss guards start to come and take him away, you know, because he's not supposed to be doing that, but the Holy Father stops them, and he says, pray for who? And so he explains to him this whole story that, you know, he, he knew this priest and he went to seminary with him and he doesn't know what happened, but he's, he's now a beggar on the streets of Rome. And so the Holy Father, uh, you know, distressed by this, but agrees to pray for this poor man. So a few days later, this priest from New York is in his hotel room and he's getting ready to leave in the next few days to go back to New York. And he gets a telegram at his hotel door. And the, the telegram says, the Holy Father wants to have lunch with you, and he wants you to bring your friend, the beggar, the fallen away priest. And uh, 
the, the priest says, well, I, don't, I have no idea where this guy is, but I got to find him now. So he, he goes out into the streets and he, he starts going by many of the churches that he had seen him before. And eventually he finds him. And he, he says, you know, he comes up to him and, he's, and he says, you know, do you remember me? And he's like, yes, I remember you. Why are you bothering me again? And uh, he says, well, you're not going to believe this, but the Holy Father wants to have dinner with us. And he says, what, no way. There's no way I'm going to go have dinner with the Pope, right? You know, look, I, I'm, I'm in rags, you know, I'm, I'm a beggar on the street. I'm not going to go eat dinner with the Pope. And he says, no, you don't understand. You're my ticket to get to dinner. So you're coming to dinner. I know, yeah, I've got a hotel room. You can shower there. Uh, I got clothes that you can wear. Uh, we'll figure this out, but you're coming to dinner. And so he, reluctantly, he gets the man to agree. So he gets him all cleaned up. And they get ready to go and meet with the Pope and to have their, their, their dinner with the Pope. And so every, they're, they're, they show up at St. Peter's and they're directed to the, the, the personal dining area of the Holy Father. And they begin dinner and it's making pleasantries. They're uh, eating a fine meal. And then eventually the Holy Father motions, stands up and motions for everybody to leave except this one priest, this fallen away priest, this beggar. And uh, the priest from New York is thinking, you know, what's going on here? You know, everybody's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like he's getting summoned to the principal's office or something, right? You know, he's, he's, he's in trouble now. And so they, they all leave and they leave, the, uh, they leave the fallen priest in with the Holy Father. And like five minutes goes by, 10 minutes goes by, 15 minutes goes by, 20 minutes goes by, and nothing, you know, they don't hear anything. Until finally, the, the, the beggar comes out of the Pope's office, and he meets up with his friend from New York, and, he, and he, the, the priest from New York, he, he just couldn't hold it anymore. He says, well, what happened? What, what went on in there? And he says to him, well, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And he said, just try me. Just tell me what, 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 what happened. And he said, well, the Pope motioned. He brought me over to his office, and he grasped my hands, and he said, Father, would you hear my confession? And he said, no, I, I, I can't do that. Holy Father, I'm, I'm, I'm just a beggar. You know, I can't do that. And they said, the Holy Father looked into his eyes and said, so am I. And he said, but Holy Father, I, I, I can't. I, I've, I've, you know, lost my priesthood. I don't have any faculty to hear confessions or anything like, right, like that. And he says, well, I'm the Pope. I can reinstate you with your consent. Do you consent? And he says, did you consent? And he said, well, how could I not? So you heard the Pope's confession? He said, yeah. And he said, well, surely the Pope didn't take 20 minutes to confess. What else was going on in there? And he said, well, after, after that, I knelt down and asked the Holy Father to hear my confession, and that's what all that time took. And that poor priest who was reinstated by the Holy Father that night, he was given a mission, a commission by the Pope. He said, I want you to go back to that church where you were begging, and I want you to go and minister to all the, our fellow beggars and to bring them back into the mercy and the knowledge and the great love of Almighty God. This, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the life that God wants to give to us. This is the great peace, the great love that he is constantly reaching out and offering to us at every moment of every day. The question is, is am I responding to it? Am I trying to make excuses? Am I trying to be defensive like Adam? Or am I making the choice to humbly accept the love of God and the peace that he desires to bring to me? There's no greater gift than being restored in the life and the love of God when we go and offer ourselves to him in the great sacrament of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In a few moments, we will uh, have benediction, uh, the blessing with the 
Blessed Sacrament, and then I will be available in confession for anybody else who would still like to go. Uh, there is a basket in the back of um, the church, I think in the vestibule area. If you feel so moved to offer a donation to the Fathers of Mercy, um, I invite you to please do so. Uh, m many of the donations that you provide help to uh, support the missions that we do, but then also, most especially, the training of our men in seminary. So I um, ask you to, to please consider that and uh, to thank you all for coming.